Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Diaspora Rhythms First Virtual Art Smart of 2022, titled Inside Story Curators Tell All. I'm Sherry Harris, your host for, for this event. And just a few house rules, as Amina mentioned. Please hold your questions and comments for the question and answer session at the end of the event. And please keep your microphones muted. Now, I would like to introduce the moderator for today's event, who you have already met. <laughs> she is the founder and president of Dickerson Global Advisors, LLC, and as a professional coach and strategist to emerging leaders, the um, philanthropic community and nonprofit organizations. Her consulting practice focuses on leadership advancement, cultural planning, nonprofit development, and strategic partnerships. She currently serves as co-interim director for the Smart Museum of Art at the University of Chicago and has a rich professional experience in arts management, cultural programming, and community engagement. She founded her coaching and consulting practice, Dickerson Global Advisors in 2010, with an emphasis on executive leadership, strategy, and organizational stewardship. Because of her extensive background and our limited time today, I encourage everyone to visit her website at dickersonsglobaladvisors.com and also um, view her video on History Makers. And to, uh, without further ado, I want to welcome Ms. Amina Dickerson as our moderator. Thank you so much, Sherry, for that. That's very kind. Uh, just a couple of corrections. I, um, I'm no longer the co-interim director, which has given me more time. I'm so happy about that. And okay. uh, um, yeah, uh, I think that's the only one. Oh, I know. Okay. The other one that I was just going to suggest, as you have questions, I invite you to put them in the chat. That way we can cue them up and I might stitch some of those in along the way, okay? So welcome everybody. We, we've got, a, I, I think, a really juicy topic for you today for this uh, first Art Smart of the year. Um, I wanna thank you for making time to join us. We've got about a 90 minute program uh, and that includes time, uh, as we've noted, uh, for some of your questions and comments in the discussion. I think it's really important that this is not us talking at you, but talking with you. Um, uh, we're exploring the evolving role of cura curators. And I know that this is like curators tell all. We'd need a couple of days for curators to tell all of the stories that they have. Uh, but we did want to explore, you know, what does it take to be a curator? What is the training that is needed? What, what pathways have led people uh, to uh, the work that they are doing now? What is the influence that curators have in cultural spaces? Uh, I I think it's really interesting as somebody who worked in the museum field um, for over 20, 20, nearly 25 years, and I'm drawn back to working with museums now, that um, that title, that, that, that uh, name of curator is no longer restricted to solely art spaces. We've got curated gift boxes. We've got curated wine and food. We've got curated playlists, curated meals. I mean, you name it, we've got a curator for it today. Um, and so we live in a time when curator has become a sort of uh, a euphemism for having a specialized kind of knowledge, a, a kind of taste maker, a kind of uh, elevated style. They, that is curators, guide us through history, through the arts, uh, and through a variety of social practices, past, present uh, included. They frame ideas. Curators help us explore connections. They help us basically to see. And so to be a curator in an earlier era, uh, certainly when I joined the field in uh, the 1970s, so I'm dating myself a little bit here, mm -hmm. uh, and even before me, um, there was uh, there were very few African Americans working in the field. Uh, you know, outside of culturally specific institutions um, that date back to the mid 19th century, late 19th century, to be a part of uh, a museum as a black curator was to be a part and 
a part. That is, you were part of a very closed, select, and exclusive community. Uh, and you had already, uh, of course, had to undertake uh, the requisite advanced study and, uh, and all of that. But um, as uh, African-American curators, as other BIPOC curators, uh, they faced a lot of discrimination. They were denied opportunities for their creative and intellectual exploration. There are many reasons that that has shifted, although perhaps not so much. There's an article uh, in Artnet this week about how after uh, hiring so many Black uh, uh, women for top jobs in the museum field, uh, so many of them are already leaving. So there's still a challenge there for us. Um, uh, in addition to uh, the sort of broadening space for curators to do their work. They're not just in museums, they're in galleries, they're in community spaces, they're in auction houses. Uh, and so I want to have uh, with this wonderful panel today, the opportunity to understand what led to that kind of disruption and that broadening of the use of uh, the sort of curatorial lens on things. Uh, uh, these are very, very talented women who also have uh, designed for them themselves a kind of curatorial space. And so we're going to hear from each of them, uh, Zudeka, uh, uh, who is uh, Zudeka Nzinga, who is in Washington, D.C., and has a really interesting uh, practice that is not only making art, but selling that art as a fine art business. She does a lot of workshops and she does contracting and developing art education programs. And I know she has a special interest in talking about art. Uh, she is joined by uh, the one and only Leslie Guy. Uh, who is uh, in Chicago now, but started her career on the East Coast as well. Um, uh, uh, Leslie brings not only curator skills, but collections management skills. And so I'm, I'm inviting her to talk about just the range of uh, opportunity that uh, is a part of doing curatorial work, if not necessarily serving as a curator, uh, collections manager, uh, uh, exhibition designer, uh, preparators, conservators, all of that kind of thing. And then finally, um, uh, bringing uh, in the Southwest, we have uh, the wonderful Janice Bond. Uh, Janice used to be in Chicago, and that's where I got to know her. But Janice has also designed for herself a really wonderful and unique career as a cultural architect. Again, um, uh, how are we using those terms? An art advisor and also an interdisciplinary um, uh, artist. So what's going to happen is each of them is going to have five minutes to talk a little bit about their training, their views about curatorial work. Uh, they each have selected uh, some artworks that they will talk about. They will have five minutes. And uh, artists, I remind you, you have five minutes. And Amina will burst in at uh, one minute before just to say one minute, or I'll just do my finger. You've got one more minute, and we're going to ask you to wrap it up. And then we're going to have a conversation together. I'll jump in uh, in the chat with a question, and as appropriate, I'll stitch it in there, or we are reserving some time at the end. Okay. Uh, I do want to just take one minute to recognize Dan Parker, who is on the call today, who is the founder of Diaspora uh, Rhythms and uh, one of the people who is a mastermind uh, to get Together with other members of the organization uh, with this series today. So Dan, great to see you here. Our, our order of speaking for the artists is going to be first uh, Zudeka uh, from uh, Washington, D.C., uh, dialing in from, from D.C. Uh, and then we will go to Leslie Guy and we'll wind up with Janice uh, Bond. Okay, so without further ado, uh, it's 117 and Zudeka, we are delighted to have you share with us a little bit of your background and your artwork. So welcome, welcome, welcome. The floor is yours. Good afternoon, everybody. I am really happy to be here. I'm really honored to be here. Um, my name is Sudeka Nzinga Terrell. Um, as an artist, I go by Sudeka Nzinga, but I am also married to an artist. And um, we run a business together called Terrell Arts DC, where we offer arts education, um, art special events. So we do paint and sips, live painting, installation art, um, murals, uh, workshops for all ages. Um, uh, we do a lot of things under the Terrell Arts DC. 
Um, I myself am a self-taught artist, originally from Aurora, Colorado, which is a suburb just outside of Denver. Um, I have been an artist forever. I've always made things and I've always had a, a really good knack for selling things. And I've been curating since before I knew that that was even like a thing that a person could do. Um, I started out on the scene as a spoken word artist and um, evolved into hosting my own poetry venues. Um, I would put art up there. Uh, that evolved into, um, I started an art festival in Aurora, Colorado, and then I moved to Washington, D.C. to uh, pursue my career in arts. Um, recently, and like some of the pictures that you're seeing are from um, a curatorial grant that I received from the DC Commission of the Arts and Humanities, uh, where they give you uh, $25,000 to do a virtual and physical uh, show. And I did, I showed work from um, DC area art teachers examining uh, their experiences during the pandemic. Um, I've also curated for uh, this community gallery space, which is called Bloom Bars. I, I did um, several shows with them. Um, this exhibit called Shoulder the Deed was um, a historical uh, look at how Black artists contributed to a specific area um, in Washington, D.C. So I'm really into like the, the research and uh, putting together pieces. I've learned a lot about installing work, which is actually not my favorite thing to do. Um, <laughs> I, I curated and installed several of my husband's shows as well. And so um, I, don't, I don't, I think that's about it. Oh, well, you know, I'm a painter. I didn't send any images of my artwork, but I am a, a painter and I, you can see a bunch of, I'm in the studio right now. So there's a bunch of artwork behind me, but I specialize in um, mixed media collage and acrylic work. Um, featuring images of, uh, it used to be more exclusively Black women, but it's evolved over the last few years to um, conversations around Black family and um, how we create our spaces. I'm getting ready to start building an installation, examining Black culture and um, interior design for the National Liberty Museum in Philadelphia. Um, and then I have a bunch of solos coming up that um, are called the mini rooms, which uh, focus on how we create our sacred spaces. Well, and on top of all of that, she is a mom of three. So I don't know when she sleeps, but uh, it's pretty, pretty remarkable. Thank you, uh, Zudeka. Uh, and so let's turn our attention now to Leslie Guy. And Leslie, I invite you to talk a little bit about your background and your work and practice. So Leslie, the floor is yours. I'm going to try and ah, unmute myself. Good afternoon, everyone. I think the easiest way to sum up what I've done is to do it in two stories. So I have my background is as actually, as I said, started as a conservator, where I happen to be um, the first Black woman in the country to get a degree in art conservation, um, which is part of a longer story. And that led me to doing it. I'm gonna start off in two stories because that's the only thing that will make my story make any sense. So um, I'm from Philadelphia, as Anina said, and I got my first museum experience coming from the sciences. I loved art, but my parents told me in high school that it, I would never make a living doing it. So I had to do science. So that's what I did. Exactly. And after I got out of college, I found a way to combine the two through conservation. Ah, thank you for sharing these <laughs> images. This is an image of me uh, with Fahim Majid working on an exhibition at um, the Southside Community Arts Center. So um, the story I was gonna share was a work of uh, uh, something I did with my grand, uh, that uh, my first experience in, in a museum and was working on a Raphael Peel painting. And um, that particular painting was of an archeological conservation that across time and tides, everybody everywhere made things of beauty. And that really intrigued me because there was beauty around us everywhere in all things. It could be a monumental piece of Egyptian work that I've worked on or a small carved bone. And with each and every one of these pieces, find a meaning and a story. And that became really, really clear to me when I had an opportunity to go and do a work in Hawaii. And I was 
in a lab. I was working on a, an, a sacred li- religious piece called a feather kahili. And I was by myself in a lab. And every day I noticed this like little yellow lizard we'd be walking by. And I thought, this is really odd. I'm working on this kahili. There's this lizard. So everybody was gone from the lab. And I said to, uh, to a, a young, older gentleman who's like the age of my grandfather. And I said, you yeah, know, there's a lizard in the lab. And every time I'm working on the kahili, the lizard's there. And he pulled me aside. He reminded me of my grandfather. He pulled me by my coattail and he said, do you know what you're doing? Do you know what this piece is? I was like, ah, uh, what do you mean? And then he schooled me on the significance of this piece and this work and told me the story about it mm-hmm. and introduced me to other people who taught me more about the Hawaiian culture and the, their sacred art and what it meant for them to have their sacred art in white spaces. Fast forward many years and I decided that I needed to do something different. And I started to do my work at the African-American Museum in Philadelphia with material that was important to me and the stories behind that. And I remember one day I was working in collections with my mother, we were processing material. We had gotten a federal grant to really do service to the material in the collection. And my mom came across a document of my grandfather And there was no other place in the world that I would be a museum that would remember my grandfather. But here I was in a space that was celebrating and recognizing my own grandfather. And I had stories attached to that. My interest in curatorial work really stems from honoring materials and really relishing the stories and the people that are associated with those materials. And that really guides everything that I do. I think, you know, through the lens of every show that I do, every exhibition I do, what would my grandfather say? Not necessarily would my grandfather agree with how I said it, but I'm kind of in conversation with him in my mind. Because the things that I think are really objectionable about a lot of museum practices is there's a real tendency to try to talk above people's heads. But we all know that art is made in community by people, right? those stories are held in community. So it, I find it objectionable when it goes into a white box and then people use these multi-syllabic words that nobody uses in real life to try and tell different stories. So that's kind of what guides my work. So I, don't, I think I might have gone past my time, Tony, so we can show the slides quickly in a way that might make sense to people. And I can give it a quick one, two over if you want to. Ah, this was an exhibit. If we stop here and we go no further, this is okay. This is an exhibition that I absolutely adored. It was called As We See It. It was a Petrucci family collection of African American art, which I really loved about this collection is this collector intentionally collected African American art with the purpose of educating it. And he Everything about it, from the way he presented his work to the way he documented the work, was all about that. For that particular show, what we were, end, what we were able to do, what I did, what I decided to do, is look to the purpose of it and have an exhibition of art specifically for children, in which children were learning everything they needed to know about art through the works of African Americans. This is another project we ended up doing in Philadelphia. It was a social justice project where kids were in working in, in art spaces. Back to the, phil- uh, the other, ex- we can flip forward again, Tony, and see what image is next. Uh, this is an image of uh, a students of mine who were actually processing and working in collections. Those objects on the table actually belong to Pearl Bailey. We can Coot forward again and see what we have next. This is me working with students. We're actually working on doing an exhibition of the Supremes. So we did an all exhibition around the Supreme gowns and these are students who are working with me on that project. You can flip forward again and see what we got next. And this is me with Fahim. Uh, working on, um, and, and this is a project that I was done with the uh, Floating Museum here in Chicago. This was done at, at the DuSable. It was a wonderful exhibition. And these are community members who are making response pieces, and they're all in display within the museum itself. That was a great show. 
Wonderful, wonderful, Leslie. Thank you so much. Um, I, I, I'm just seeing a thread uh, that is beginning here that is talking about access. I heard that in uh, Zadeka's uh, commentary about putting uh, the exhibitions together for artists, with artists, and presenting them in community. And you've really, uh, I think, uh, identified something very important about how you're showing up as a, somebody working in curatorial space, the kinds of materials that you prefer to work with, and the engagement of younger people and younger audiences and really understanding uh, the value of the real thing and how it needs to be preserved. So we're going to come back to that point in just a minute, but really great. And I have to say that Leslie and I also share a little background because I also worked at the Philadelphia Afri African American Historical and Cultural Museum of Philadelphia before I came mm -hmm. So lots of stories we share there. Okay, I'm going to ask people one more time. I put it in the chat. Please, if you are not a speaker, please, please mute yourself. Thank you. Uh, I can talk more quietly now. Ruth, uh, I know Ruth is having a little difficulty trying to get herself. There you go, Ruth. You got it. You got it. I see you. Uh, okay. So our last curator today, uh, or cultural architect, art advisor, interdisciplinary artist, is someone who I had the great pleasure of working with uh, when we were doing a cultural plan for the city of Chicago, and then again at Navy Pier. And that is one uh, Janice Bond. So Janice, I want to bring you into the conversation and ask you to share a little bit about what has been a very, very diverse background, what made you leave Chicago for Texas, and the kind of work that you're doing now. So Janice, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's, it's so wonderful to see some of the names and faces. Um, some of you I haven't seen in person in a number of years, as many of us haven't seen many of each other in person in a number of years, some even before um, 2020. Um, but I would say that my practice has been diverse and it's the same three things though, a number of different ways. It's always arts, culture, and community. And so I think about that in regards to, you know, my administrative practice um, as uh, most recently, you know, I was the deputy director of the Contemporary Arts Museum of Houston, or whether it's been individual or independent curatorial practice or even um, civic art and design and conservation. Um, if there are the photos available, we could just walk through those really quickly and I'll just speak to a few things throughout. Are those available? Yep, just give them a second. There you go. Okay, great. So um, this is an exhibition um, that started in Chicago um, it was abandoned margins, um, policing the black female body um, that eventually traveled to UICA in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And, you know, when it comes to my curatorial practice, one thing I noticed really early on uh, about myself, everyone has like different styles, but one of the key things is about, uh, I think about pre-existing values, you know, both in artists, communities, institutions, and not necessarily, um, buying in as a curator just to the hierarchical nature of uh, whether it's demographic, age, uh, CV of artists. And so this was my first opportunity to really dig deeper um, into my practice. I wanted to pair local, when I say hyper-local, I mean like Chicago, and I see uh, one of the artists uh, on, uh, Candace Hunter, um, her, her, uh, her series was a part of this exhibition. And so I think about from hyper-local to national to international artists um, that were part of this exhibition, it was really great to pair artists of different experiences and mediums and different conversations uh, all under the same uh, lens. And I started to think about how that would shape my practice going forward. I really wanted to pair uh, artists of different generations and not only have them their works in conversation, but I found that ultimately they would individually, um, they would end up in conversation together. And so there was a lot of opportunities uh, for different artists, even those who lived in the same city to experience each other's work. Um, sometimes it led to collaborations, but ultimately it created a space where 
the exhibitions that I, I started curating had quite a bit more dimension because artists from different locations, different generations, uh, different spaces in time with the different levels of engagement and technology throughout generations would have a different relationship with material by default. And so you would see that shine in the work. And I really enjoyed um, this particular exhibition. It had 22 artists from all over the world, um, different mediums. And what you're seeing to the left is an installation that I thought was really interesting from two artists in North Carolina called Nature's Intent. Those are all hand, hand screened um, boxes. It's an um, installation called the Dreamy Creamy Crack House. And um, it is made in reference to uh, respectability pod politics, black hair and infrastructure. But we can go on to the next slide. Uh, Janice, you've got about a minute and a half. Mm -hmm. and yeah, let's just pass through. Essentially, the, in the entire thing is that when I think about my curatorial practice and I think about where things are going um, for myself and others, it's really just about not so much being caught up in the where or the how um, or even the what, but is who you're connecting with and who's connecting with the work um, that you're pulling together, that the artists are creating, that you're preserving, conserving, and what you're sharing with the world. And so right now I'm spending a lot of time uh, managing um, collections and, and civic art and design, project managing those both in aviation, um, transportation, et cetera. And this final slide, which I'm very proud of, is that I'm currently the co-curator um, for artist Ming Smith's, if you could go back one, Ming Smith's um, first um, museum full survey exhibition alongside um, James Bartlett um, that will open at the Contemporary Arts Museum of Houston and then tour a summer of next year. And then in the last slide, the show that's up right now, um, I've developed and am expanding the visual and curio curatorial arts program um, over at the August Wilson African American Cultural Center at Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And the show that's currently on view is Garrett Bradley's American Rhapsody. Thank you. Wonderful, Wonderful. thank you so much. Uh, okay, so now um, we've gotten a little sense of uh, the connective dots uh, among you as curators. I, I wonder if, and, and I'll just throw this out and whoever would like to uh, speak to it first, that's fine. Otherwise, you know, I will call on you. Uh, but uh, just because we have such a, a variety of people on the call today, could you just talk a little bit about what the training and uh, sort of the basic skill sets that you need to have to be a curator in a visual arts context today? Then I'm going to talk. I'm going to call on you, Leslie Guy, to get us started as somebody who was the first uh, um, conservator, trained conservator in the country. Talk a little bit about what is curatorial work. When we say you're a curator, what do you do? Right. I think it, as you said, Amina, it, it is a variety of things. But this is um, what I have said that I've noticed. One of the projects that I'm working on, right? One of the things I'm doing right now is working um, with. I've gone back to the graduate program I I went back to, and I've been working with curatorial students and conservation students, um, and their approach to their work and their profession has dr changed dramatically, mm -hmm. without a doubt. There is there are very few emerging students now who actually want to go into traditional art making spaces. Most of them are looking to forge their own path in their own way. A lot of them find that working within these really repressive systems is not what they want to do. That's not how they want to spend their time. And I found that to be very striking. Um, I think the range um, of people's experiences really change, is, is really different. One of the things that I can say that I've noticed is a trend, but, but is it necessarily a prerequisite that what it, there is a lot more emphasis now than there once was on having a doctorate degree. I'm not saying it's a necessity. I'm, I've noticed that in some cases, in some places, it's a trend. But I think equally as true is that people come from a variety of points of view. And there are a lot of people who are making their own way and making their own spaces. And for me, that is the most interesting work that is happening right now. 
That's that's really the, this PhD fixation and the credentialization um, was something that I thought uh, the field was beginning to move away from, but evidently not entirely. I would say this um, for the students that I have had, I, there was um, about four years ago um, when I was in Philadelphia, I got um, a grant to actually bring um, curators into the field. And what we were doing for that particular grant was really top, you know, kind of targeting doctoral fellows. I have found from the students who have that degree, they are more protected in the system. In the system. In the so, system. and by the system, could you just say, are we talking about traditional <laughs> museums? In the traditional museum system, those students have been more protected. Uh huh. Uh, so they're given the opportunity, they're given budgets, they're given exhibition. They're uh, given the, what I would say is um, the kinds of overt and blatant racism that they, that many student people do still, it's, it's a shield, it's not a necessity. I would say that it's a shield in those spaces. So their credibility is not challenging. It is not, this. yeah. Yeah, yeah, not to yeah. the same degree. I don't think that it's fair, but I've noticed that it's been a reality. So Janice, what do you think about that? Because you you really have curated in all your own spaces. Uh, you know, you've made your, when I say your own spaces, I mean, you have really sort of designed where you want to do your curating work and have not sort of sought to be, you know, the assistant curator, the senior curator, the director of curatorial affairs at one of the big mainstream institutions. So what is your take on the skills and this moment in curatorial practice? I would like to answer that, but I also wanna ask Leslie a question. Hi, Leslie, um, I miss you. One, one quick question, would that also apply to experimentation um, as far as like the shield and being able to like mm -hmm. challenge the current institutional <laughs> system based upon their department? I'm just I would say that. for for students who for pe for people who want to do that, I don't think it's as necessary. I'm I'm talking about people who are going into traditional museum spaces. Like, um, that's what I would say. That's what I found for those oh, particular. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so just uh, to clarify, the question is really, do you need that advanced or will an advanced degree protect you if in fact you're trying to do something radical and disruptive in a traditional space? And what I'm hearing from Leslie is the response is nine times out of 10, they're not trying to do that disruptive kind of new thinking <laughs> in a traditional in that, space. Because they, 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 they're not going to, you can't do it there. You can't do it. So right. that's it, doesn't, it doesn't fit the norm, it right? It doesn't fit. So yeah. for the current students I'm talking about that I'm working with that are currently getting their degrees, they just want to make their own spaces. They don't even be bothered with the old, they want to make their own spaces. For the, the, the students who I had like five to seven years prior, maybe 10 years prior, they have their doctorate degrees and are going into those traditional spaces. But I've noticed a huge gap in the, in the past 10 years about where students are interested in being. Oh, gotcha. So okay. I'll say for my, thank you. So I would say for myself, I mean, I was a business major. Um, I, a lot of people don't know this, I suppose, don't talk about it too much, but I was a business and, and communications major, major. So I always saw art from, um, although I, I felt the like passion and connection, I could see things as a creative, as an artist. Very early on, I didn't see curatorial or even anything in the art world being a true career path um, or a possibility. I didn't know what a curator was until I was probably my junior year in college. Um, so, you know, being very transparent about it. So I had been surrounded though around by creative people and wonderful budding um, and or larger historical institutions. I grew up going to Project Row Houses in Houston, you know, amongst other spaces and, you know, the Community Arts Collective and, and things like that. So I grew up in these, these spaces and I, as I grew and started to even develop or even had the courage to consider myself or call myself aloud um, an artist and a curator, I really... I suppose because of my my background just in community or the way I grew up, I didn't grow up in a, an arts home. 
Um, although my parents did allow me to experience those things through relatives or field trips. I remember going to Jones Hall as a small child and seeing the symphony. Um, I just really immediately unintentionally bypassed the system when it came to the consideration of whether or not I wanted to do a thing. Um, because I didn't, I didn't have the first inkling of where that pipeline even opened. I didn't know any curators. I didn't know anyone who worked in a museum. My first, uh, and I'll shorten this, my first engagement, just to put it this way, at of the Contemporary Arts Museum of Houston, uh, when I was 10 years old, uh, I want, where I later became, decades later, became the deputy director. When I was 10 years old was the first time I visited that museum. I visited that museum because my grandmother was a domestic in the neighborhood that the museum was in. And while she was working in homes, I would wander into the museums and museum district to be out of the way. But I didn't see it as a place where I could actually do anything or be anything. These were almost like these edifices of, of inequality that I just learned to live with and be enamored by. And so with that, um, I think I just grew up in a way and in, in my practice and administrative practice in a way to where I can walk into an institution or within a group. And if there's an idea or a collective or a possibility, and I know that collectively we can do it because no exhibition happens alone, not by a long shot, even if you have a fantastically brilliant idea. Uh, it's really more so, do you want this to happen or not? Do you want this movement in your institution or within your group or within your collective to happen or not. And if that's the case, then we could move forward. But otherwise, my administrative and artistic or curatorial practice did not develop in a way that from the beginning would put up um, these, these barriers that, you know, do exist within the structure, but I, I didn't build a practice or I wasn't educated to um, have those be the foundation by which I consider what it is that I wanted to do. And so if it's, so I did work with Brooklyn Museum. I worked with this institution, that institution, because I didn't really see how, I knew the barriers were there, but because I wasn't indoctrinated into those pipelines, it was almost as if to my benefit, they were a bit invisible to me. And so they, it worked to my benefit. And so I see that a little bit, even now, even though I, I understand the system a bit more, sometimes there's a, a willful, um, a willful healthy sense of delusion sometimes going into to these rooms, because if I was to look at every institution and every possibility and every, um, especially if you're dealing with civic art and design, I mean, you could see all of the barriers and political barriers there and, and wouldn't even begin to start. Mm -hmm. So what do you need? I think it's a, a combination of, yes, education, but at the end of the day, you have to decide what is it that you want your cur curatorial practice to do for you and how many no's or maybes or possibles are you willing to work around or move through in order to continue and grow and sustain your practice? Because there will be a lot of them either way. So I wanna get uh, Zudeka into this uh, conversation because I know she's also someone who comes out of a non-traditional background, if you will, uh, by, by Western standards uh, in, in terms of both being a uh, visual artist and painting and creating work, but also how you presented that work. So what are the skill sets that you, and, and I guess even less the skill sets, I do wanna go back and talk a little bit about what formal training for some of uh, this work is, but I'm more interested in how you have uh, approached bringing your curatorial eye, if you will, and your sensibility about sharing work with community into the spaces where you operate in Washington and elsewhere. Um, you know, I would say that for me, I didn't even know that what like a curator really was until I was like in my probably mid 20s, I always I've always liked art. And so I would pick art that I like and put it up. And it was like very basic in those terms. I think that um, as I evolved in my career as an artist um, and working with curators, you know, I think probably the first time I had a curator call and say, hey, I want to do a studio visit so I can like learn more about your work. I need to write, you know, I, I want to introduce you to somebody who's going to write something about your work to, you know, be in this exhibition that I was like, okay, so being a curator is about much more than just like, oh, I like the art and I'm going to put it up. Um, I think that as I've 
continue to have opportunities. I have, I have contemplated, um, you know, like I, I went through a little time where I was like, I'm going to go to Micah and I'm going to get my master's in um, curating. But I think that for me, I really had to sit down and think about what is it that I actually want. And to be quite frank, because I have been self-employed for so long, I have no interest in battling racism on a day-to-day -day basis for the right to like show my work. I'm done. I'm not dealing with folks like that in this lifetime anymore. Um, and I think that this era, uh, we are really empowered to be able to do that because of social media, really. Um, it, the social media kind of allows us to bypass certain aspects of certain systems and get support to put things together in different ways. Um, I also have found that as a Black identified curator in the last several years, um, as these institutions start to get called out for um, their lack of uh, opportunities that they give to people who look like us or whose backgrounds are, are similar to ours, it has started to open up a lot of avenues to kind of get into some institutional spaces that would never have contemplated having somebody like me come in um, and curate a show. And so, you know, in terms of like my personal practice and, and my personal thoughts, I just got to a point where I decided like, I have an intense interest in Black American art and Black American artists, and I'm going to study that. And I'm going to study that on my own, and I'm going to learn it on my own. And I'm going to use the opportunities that I have to put together the shows that I want to put together and the things that, you know, are really important to me and then utilize my networks to get support and get collectors and, and establish certain relationships. And so I really, I think that it's important for somebody who's thinking about getting into being a curator to really contemplate, you know, what it is that you want, because, you know, like you might want to, you might want to be at the Guggenheim trying to like, you know, get our voices included in there. And there are things that you do have to go through to get to that point and things you're going to have to endure um, on a day-to-day -day basis. To me, if I'm ever going to be in the Guggenheim, it would be because I submitted the best proposal because I have no interest in being in a day-to-day -day situation where I'm dealing with them folks. I don't want that energy around me. I don't want it creeping into my art. I don't want it creeping into like the experience that the artists who I'm working with have. Um, and then I think that it's important for us to also think about carving out our own spaces to tell our stories. Because when I'm doing a show and I'm interviewing these artists who a lot of people may have never heard of, if I write something about them, if I put together a beautiful catalog about them, that's grassroots, uh, you know, curatorial, getting the word out about you know, who certain artists are and we're sharing our collectors and we're sharing our, our connections. I'm on a lot of different boards. So I'm always trying to like, you know, suggest people or recommend people or connect people. Um, and so, you know, I think, I think at the end of the day, it's about what you want from, from your own career. I think uh, I, I saw a lot of heads going up and down with some, et cetera. Okay, the recording is back. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but but um, I, I think the thing that you said at the end there is really important. What is it that you're seeking to do as a curator? What is the impact you're trying to have? Who is the audience, uh, to Leslie's point, Janice's point as well, who is the audience that you're trying to engage? What is it that you want them to take away from this encounter, this experience uh, with art? Uh, and so you, you talk about uh, curating in that way. Um, uh, uh, Zudeka, and I'm wondering, so you've got the work, what is the space? Where are you showing this work if it's not in the mainstream institution? What are these new spaces that are popping up all over? And then I invite Janice and, and uh, Leslie to weigh in. And I want you to answer that kind of quickly because I want to get to a few more questions, okay? Yes, I think that people would be surprised at how many of the museums have calls out for curatorial proposals and just like you doing the work on what you love and having it already put together and having a thorough proposal, uh, especially now and especially as a Black um, identify a curator and artist, these places are looking for that. They are recognizing that they're not involved enough in the community. And so like, I'm, and I'm a no fear person. Like I have my own proposal. I'll call a museum. I'll call a curator and be like, hey, you know, I need this show in here. You, there's grants for um, curatorial opportunities. There's open calls for proposals. Um, I think that as artists and as curators, we need to get on top of looking at those opportunities and submitting the best body of work for them. 
Mm -hmm. Les, what, how would you uh, respond to that? Oh, I have complicated feelings. <laughs> we'll talk, let's talk complication. My complicated feelings come from this is I think it comes from working in museums for so many decades that um, I'm kind of tired of supporting spaces that I feel don't necessarily deserve that at times. I have to say that. I am you got some snaps from Zadeka on that. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess, I, I guess it's leading to my own personal passion project that I'm working on right now that I can get to. But right now, I am not really interested in working on things that go to an institution that has barriers to get in and it, and it costs something. I'm not interested mm -hmm. at all. Period. Janice shaking her head. So, <laughs> so this is opening up the space for more public artwork. It, it is. is. Uh, and, and, and I want to ask you, because you've had this experience, and Janice, I, I do want to get your voice in here. But, you know, we have another whole community of culturally specific museums who are also looking for material, who also need strong scholarship and, and thoughtfulness around what it is that they are showing so that they can inform and engage a public. Uh, are, those, are those allies for this work and this kind of curatorial vision or are they adhering to what the mainstream is doing or both? Well, I guess since I'm talking to, to a group of collectors, this is what I will say coming from my collecting background and also a charge to you, which is this. There are wonderful culturally specific museums out there, HBCUs with fantastic collections, and I've seen them firsthand. But I also know working with collections, how expensive it is to maintain a collection. I mean, if you're talking about something as simple as climate controlled storage, which is kind of a baseline, that is thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars a month, right? I remember um, working on a project and it was a bit with a very, very large collection, a collection in the millions of dollars. And I sat down one day and I did, the, you know, a back of a, the sheet um, calculation because my job at that time was to help oversee moving a collection of millions of objects up. Collections were coming through my space. And I said, let me do a back of the envelope calculation of what it was costing for each one of these objects coming through here. And just to come through my shop with the people who were working on me, with me, it was five to $10 per object, right? That adds up real quick. Mm -hmm. So I say, if you think about giving collection, along with that collection comes a bequest. You need to give money so that the object that you love and care for can be cared for in the future. It's wonderful to give stuff. It's equally as important to give the finances so that stuff that you're giving can be cared for, supported, and used in the future. So that's my collection side <laughs> to the collector saying, yeah, it's equally as important. Okay. And, and to culturally specific museums, uh, I mean, having worked in them and studied them, they very often do not have those resources. Right now we're looking at the Southside Community Arts Center and uh, know the extraordinarily important uh, role it plays in African-American art history, in Chicago's uh, cultural scene, and the millions of dollars it's going to cost to finally, in the 21st century, provide for that institution, the kind of HVAC, the, the heating, cooling, air. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, we're talking about databases. We're talking about people who destabilize it. We're talking about people on staff with expertise in those areas to care for those collections. That is some, uh, uh, there was a question in here uh, that I just want to raise because that is exactly what they wanted to know. And then we're going to go on to another question. Uh, how, uh, how would um, uh, someone who, a, a Black artist who aspires to be recognized as uh, successful uh, as an artist or curator properly navigate um, the systems? Now, they're talking very much about mainstream systems here, but they, they ask, what are the credentials that are needed? 
how do you, what, what exactly are those credentials? And, uh, you know, it, it seems that the three of you have, uh, well, two of you at least, have not gone through that formal training for a curatorial credential. But, uh, you know, we're talking what, art, uh, at least some knowledge, some art historical background. You know, Janice, you're, you're mounting shows. Zadeka, you're, you're writing labels. What kind of skill sets for somebody who says, I want to do that, I'm not sure yet, if I want to do it in uh, the established system or outside of that, but I need to have a grounding. This is a senior in high school about to go off to college. What would you tell them they need to study? Um, so, okay, I, 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 I guess I, I, I'm thinking about that in part because right now one of the things I'm doing is reading essays from college students who are tr trying to apply to different fellowship programs. Um, and people are coming from all over. Um, and I hesitate, but I say the traditional, a, a path that students are taking, the students that I'm currently with and working with are taking, is they are really focusing in on whatever particular area of study they're interested in, whether it is 19th century art, whatever it is, whatever it is. And Lots of them are getting MFAs. Some of them are getting PhDs. It's absolutely right. But the reality is dovetailing back. One of their current professors said to me about this current group of students, dovetailing back to what Janice and Suzeka said, which was really important. This current group of students are very entrepreneurial. They might be getting that PhD, but they, a lot of them, some of them have their own curatorial practices before they get to school that they are not giving up. That's not something that would have happened when I was in school, right? They are not giving up who they are. They're not giving up their own practices just because they're getting that degree. So I can say, yeah, you can get that degree. But at the end of the day, Janice is right. You need to know how to get stuff done, especially now. Okay, so Key, Key is asking a question. I'll put this to you, Janice. Um, um, is there a way around all of that credentialization to get to do the work as an artist? I'm just going to give a broad stroke on this because, you know, just sort of thinking of a couple of things that we've been discussing and then landing on this, it's not the either or, it's a, a both a both and. The reality is, is that although I was a, a business major, studied and all of that, um, at the time when I realized that I wanted to go into the art world as a curator or an administrator, I didn't have the fiscal resources to go to the school that I wanted to, you know, even if I wanted to, you know, even if, even if I tried. Um, those resources just weren't there. Um, and, you know, so it's one of those things where I found myself in the spot where I was like, okay, well, do I wait, you know, a few more years until I'm able to save and do this? Or do I take out more loans? Or what are the choices? So what am I saying? What I'm saying is that you have to at some point decide what you want your career to do for you. And kind of be, if, if that's selfish, then that's what it is. Think about it as an artist, as a curator, as an administrator. And it will, it will evolve over time. I think about someone who is this tenured educating experience as, as you, Leslie, like you, you are talking about, you know, we're talking about your history, but now you have, with all of this experience, you're reshaping and have refined that into the next core path is even more streamlined and focused and specific. And I found myself, you know, years later in that same space. And so understand that different institutions, even different curators, even if they look like you, they may look like you, but they're, every institution ha may not have the same interest and or agenda when it comes to engagement, um, exhibitions, the way that they engage their board, and all of those things. And you will have no way as an incoming artist or a curator to know the full landscape of all of that mm -hmm. um, and until you're in it. And so really what you have to do is decide what it is, who you want to work with, or even where you want to show. Start to build a general framework, either as an artist or as a curator or both or administrator. I remember someone told me once, if I pursued a career as both a curator and an artist simultaneously, I was literally told by um, an administrator I respected at the time that no one would ever take me seriously. And I remember literally looking and I had two choices in that moment, keeping a straight face. I was like, wow, I respected you so much. 
<laughs> you know, I believed you so much up until this point, because mm. the other side of that was that I could have believed that and had to make a decision between my practice. And a month later, that's when I opened both uh, Beyond the Binary, my solo show and Abandoned Margins, Policing the Black Female Body the same night in the same institution on different floors. And so I say all that to say, don't wait for someone to validate the pathway that you want to choose as an artist. It's way too complex and ephemeral and from institution to institution and even the people within the institution, it is just a web of decisions, politics and things. You will spend your whole career trying to figure it out and then it'll still change. So it's better that you decide what it is that you wanna do and hone in on your practice, whether you're able to do it as a student. Um, I do see that several of my friends who are painters, who are work in material and sculpture, went to the Art Institute and other places, you can see it in their work. They are seasoned and it is beautiful. And then there's some people that are just naturals, you know, that they go in and they can do a thing. You have to be real with yourself. Am I a natural? And there's something that I want to polish and learn a bit more about. There are still areas, you know, I don't have a PhD, but I know that I want one in the future, not because it'll give me more of a space in an institution, but more so I just want to develop a structure by which I'm able to study something specific and have that add to my own practice. So in closing, I say uh, there, it's not about having a way around it. You can go through the front door, back door, side door, rooftop window, whatever you decide is fine. You just have to be very clear with yourself about the pathway and your threshold, um, both for um, assimilation, for education, for rejection, for experimentation. You have to get within yourself an understanding of what that threshold is and that pathway is for yourself and craft the relationships and the pathway of pursuit to align with that. It's not about other people because the world is really big. And my first artist residency as an artist was in Eastern Europe. It wasn't even in, in anywhere in the United States. All of the residencies I thought I wanted to get into in the United States, my first residency was in, in Mark Rocco's Art Center as an artist, opened up to 5,000 people next to seven Mark Rocco paintings, something that I didn't think may happen in an artistic lifetime. So I'll just stop there, but I hope that gave, that broad stroke gave some perspective. We're and going to, uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to come to you in just a minute, Sudeika. I just wanted to invite people, if you have some questions, now is the time to put them in the chat because we're going to be entertaining those. And Sudeika, uh, please continue. And then I have an, another round of questions for you. Um, I just really quickly wanted to add specifically as an artist, I don't have an art degree. Um, I've not really ever taken an art class, but I study art all day so like using your, your using your resources like really know your craft and really know what you do and know how like if you're a painter know how your paint works know where to get your paint know how to talk about your paint know how to talk about your process practice talking about your process with yourself I think that the the there's two things for me that have really opened a lot of doors one is is knowing how to write a proposal. Knowing how to write a strong proposal and a strong grant is everything. And like literally I took one proposal and I applied, I got denied. Call them back and ask them why. Ask them to give you some feedback and then apply the feedback to that same proposal and send it someplace else and send it another place until somebody tells you yes. But every time somebody tells you no, ask them if they can give you some feedback as to why, because you learn so much about what different institutions and what different curators are looking for. Also knowing that like the curators are working off of their own tastes. So when you're applying for something or where you're trying to get in a show, if it's a judge or a jury or a certain curator, look them up. If they're not curating in your work aesthetic, that might not be the best place for you to be applying. That might not be the best um, call for art for you to apply for. So like paying attention to those things and then lastly, um, I say I make probably 95% of my income off of Instagram because I am posting what I'm doing, posting what I'm working on uh, so people get to see it. And then, you know, I'm meeting curators on there and um, LinkedIn. LinkedIn, if you want to get out of specific museum, go to their website, write the curators' names down and go follow them on LinkedIn and be posting your content and getting your stuff out there because curators and galleries are looking for artists too. They're actively kind of out there keeping an eye out for like who's doing what and who's got what going on. And so you wanna be able to like give the best presentation of yourself and what you have going on 
these opportunities will come to you if you're working constantly on your craft. Okay. I love what you just said about um, the discipline of continued learning and self-development. I think there's this idea that you do the work or you go through school, you get it, and then you're there, you're done, you're finished, you're complete. And both uh, Janice and, and Sudeika have both talked about the importance of personal research, of continued learning, of study, of conversation. You know, you can learn in lots of different ways of, of being out, uh, going to other people's shows, seeing how those are interpreted. And I love, you know, for somebody old like me, this idea that you're selling most of your work on Instagram is really a, a delightful thing to hear. And LinkedIn, uh, Janice uh, is, uh, you know, doing a, a plus one on the idea that LinkedIn is a tool for research as well. I wanna shift us for just a minute, uh, as we are, we've got about 10 more minutes and then uh, we're gonna do a, a sort of lightning round to, to, to begin the wrap up. Um, in my uh, conversations with you in advance, all of you have talked about the importance of educating the next generation or the young people coming on. There's a question from someone here about, you know, like what are the pipelines for young people into careers in the arts, in the visual arts, uh, whether it's on the curatorial side or as a practicing artist uh, working through a gallery or, or uh, another kind of format. So I'd love to ask you, what is it when you were curating a show or working with our artists that you want the audience coming to get from that? You know, like what is the connection, the, the linkage that you'd like your work to the audiences that come to see a show? Um, what I think about and the times in which it has happened, um, there, there are two things that I can think of. I remember putting up a show in, in Philadelphia on um, this young artist put up a painting, you know, I, I really, I didn't like this painting at all. And I was just, you know, I was not, I was on the fence about it. But the thing that happened when that painting went up is it sparked this debate among high schools about this art. They were in it toe to toe. And I love that. I love that there was this work of art. Um, and the debate was, whether Eminem should be in a black museum because it was an image of Eminem and they were hot. They were so angry. <laughs> but and I, I mean, I didn't like the painting for other reasons, but I love the fact that it was there and there was a heated debate about this piece. So for me, anytime, anything that I do can engage people in conversation, there was a, another work, the show that I did with a work of an artist called Colin Kwashi, and he had this really provocative piece called Plantation Monopoly, um, which is brilliant and troublesome and problematic for all kinds of reasons. But my son and his friends sat there, they're in high school, and they're set, and they looked at my son and said, this is funny, but this hurts. And I was like, okay, this got across. So it's like when these conversations happen and these connections happen, that, that's what means the most to me. Zudeka, you were talking about young people not thinking about careers in the arts because they're not encouraged early enough. You want to say a little bit more about that? Yeah. So um, in my my curatorial practice is largely about um, exposing and, and educating people to the rich cultural history that we have as Black Americans and the creation of art and the ways that we have put together our own art institutions. Um, and I, I prefer to select work or, or speak from a, a place of empowerment, even when um, tackling rush, rough issues, I'm very uh, particular about how those issues are explored. Um, and how they make us feel. But one of the biggest reasons for that is that growing up, you know, I grew up in Denver, so I wasn't able to go to a museum to see a lot of black art. Like my parents and my, my community really had to be the people that were exposing me to 
um, arts and specifically black arts. And, you know, a lot of times when you're, we're growing up in these situations, I always loved art, but you hear that like, oh, there's no money in art and this, that, and the other, but nobody ever was, you know, I think everybody is, is envisioning that you want to be um, Pablo Picasso and not thinking about like, well, what was Carrie James Marshall's process like, you know, like I started out as an art teacher. Um, I started out doing other things in the arts. Uh, the Smithsonian's here, the people that are the, the guards at the Smithsonian. That is a degreed position. These are people who studied arts history, who have a, a, a love for, for the, the arts in different ways. And so um, I think that creating opportunities to expose people and particularly young people to the various things that you can do in the arts, uh, either alongside your own personal art practice or as you know, whatever your interest is, you may not be somebody who wants to paint or draw, but may have a love of history and that there is a career for, in that for you. And I think that, you know, when we're putting together these exhibitions and we're inviting the community at large to engage, it's very important to target communities that aren't often targeted to get to come to the museums and get to have these conversations or come to the galleries or the pop-up space or wherever it, whatever it is that you're having. And so you know, that, that's a big uh, political thing for me is making sure that I'm creating things that are accessible to a community that may not have been previously encouraged to pursue the art and then giving them some language and some opportunities through their experience at the art exhibition to contemplate like what career path maybe they want to go in the arts. Mm -hmm. Janice? So that answers, um has shifted over time, but I'll say where I've, I've landed at this moment. It's always been about bringing, uncovering, unearthing, and sharing um, stories, narratives. Even if it's a, a singular exhibition, there are so many journeys and stories and narratives, um, especially in group exhibitions that come, um, come together um, to make those stories or that the anthology, if you will, complete. Right now, I'm really thinking a lot about uh, increasing the possibility, like the, the imagination around different spaces. Again, with civic art and design, you know, I was on a tour with um, a colleague recently looking at abandoned silos and uh, thinking about how a, a beautiful mosaic would fit on that space or a large scale, uh, large scale mural or something of that nature. I'm thinking a lot now uh, for future exhibitions of uh, bringing in uh, these these collections that are in the homes. I saw an article re recently about a, a black woman um, who's about 90 or so, who's, uh, um, it, it hurt to know that her entire collection was going to auction and we'll never see that work or most people have never in this world have, has never seen that collection and we'll never see it in the way that she imagined it or curated it or that journey, that, that story, that complete story as she's experienced it and curated it will never exist again. And so I started to really think about the artists, you know, these artists um, that are, are 50 plus, uh, their home collections, what's in their storage, their drawings, collectors. Like I'm really starting to lean into how as a curator, I can build trust um, and relationships or I can go back to relationships and say, okay, I want to bring your collection to the public. I wanna bring this artwork that you had in your studio 30 years ago um, or tell your story at institutions or in homes or in a church or, <laughs> or wherever it is that makes sense um, for you and also work with the scholars and individuals um, to create the publications to support that story so that they can be shared in institutions as well as just in the home or in a doctor's office. And so right now I'm hoping that what people, our audiences are experiencing from my exhibitions are um, our stories, uh, hope, um, possibilities, and different truths that have existed across generations. Wow, that's beautiful. Yeah. I am struck um, by, uh, Leslie, you wanna get a word in? Did yeah, you? I was just gonna chime in. Janice, we need to yeah. talk. <laughs> um, because Janice touched on something that I'm currently working on, um, and it's a project called Conduit, and I'm working on it with um, the University of Delaware, working with their preservation students and with their doctoral students to really find a way to document and preserve African-American art 
outside of traditional collecting institutions. This has got nothing to do with what's inside a traditional museum, but it's in recognition, and this is just a fact, it's a stunning one, but it's true, that a hundredth of a percent of collecting institutions, 0.01% collect African-American material and less than that collects art, which is kind of hard to sit with. When I ask funders on the national level that are giving preservation funding, like, do you have demographic breakdown on that? Nobody does. Nobody does. On a national level, when you think about representation in, inside of collections, that information isn't available right now. They've started to do some work on it in the UK because of how their funding goes. In the United States, we do not know. So this initiative that I'm beginning to start really looks at this. There is a wealth, and I, we also have to say, um, when the National Museum started kind of expanding their collection and going out and they started their initiative called oh. African-American Treasures, of course, we all know there's a lot out there. They found it. They can't take it all in. It's impossible. The same thing happened with uh, Brent Legs, what he's doing with historic preservation. There are all these new initiatives that are realizing what we all know. There's all this cultural material out there. So this initiative is about going into communities, working with communities to preserve these things, not to hoover them up and put them away where no one can see them, but to leave them in place and to drive funding there. Because the way the model works is it's the big dogs with the money that get the stuff in the collections and they put it in storage where nobody sees it. But it's kind of harnessing community to change that dynamic so work can stay where people can see it. So well, that you know, I, I'm also struck by the fact that we have many more collectors today. I mean, the work that uh, African-American curators have, have helped to sort of foster is this understanding that I also can be a collector, that I don't have to have millions and millions of dollars. If I like it and it's $25, I can buy it, I value it. And so as you're talking about, you know, what's not documented, it seems to me that both in terms of of the identification of where these collections are and the archive, the stories behind the stories uh, are important for us to, uh, to, to capture in some way. And it brings me back to where are, are what, what is it that we can do to help our culturally specific institutions? There are over 200 of these museums around the country and a new one, you know, every, every six months or so. Um, how, how do we help them embrace this, this um, impulse that is moving forward? Um, um, Mina, I just want to go back to, thank you for that. I want to just go back to a um, short anecdote over a decade ago, I started traveling to Dakar, Senegal, studying, you know, the biennial and all the art that was happening there. And I remember standing in the middle of the beach and there was a, a vendor that had these roll up paintings and I didn't have a ton of funds at the time. And I just remember thinking that this place has next Ghana, Dakar, this whole little microcosm. But if you ask anyone that lived in within a mile radius, this was just craftsmanship. This is just something that was on the side of the street. There were no auction houses. There still aren't, you know, and things have been building there. But the idea around its value, because it was in such abundance, you could throw a rock in any direction. There's just so much talent and beauty and craftsmanship. And so what I'm thinking about collectors now and institutions there needs to be more conversation about like there, it, you don't need to go out here between the collectors, the curators and the institutions. There are enough traveling, touring shows. Like I work on my original shows, but what I also do now is I go to, or I have been doing is I go to other curators that have invested their time and energy in these well-crafted shows and exhibitions. And it's like, let me, uh, let me have that show have a bit more life. Let's bring that show to Pittsburgh. Let's bring that show to Houston. Let's continue the life of all of this effort and investment that both you and the artists and the institution have put into this work. And so increasing the conversation around exhibitions that are created and also looking at these collections. If you are a collector and you have a relationship, I'll say specifically with a, a black curator, why not invite them in and say, you know what? I have this collection. Let's see what we can do with this. 
you know, why don't you create something around this work as an artist, if you have a collection? And as a collector, I finally called myself a collector. Um, when I became a member of Das for Rhythms, I remember standing next to Patrick McCoy and asking like, well, how do you know if you're a collector or not? And it's similar to what you said. He was just like, do you like music? And I was like, yeah. He's like, well, how do you choose the music that you like? How do you choose a record or whatever it is that you choose? You know, it's the same thing. Don't overcomplicate it. You know, people do it for different reasons. And so I say all that to say is that I think sometimes because of the idea of what we're chasing gets a sense, and I'll say collectively, as institutions, as curators, as collectors, as artists, what we think we're supposed to be doing sometimes gets in the way of how simple it is for us to work together and mm -hmm. elevate and sustain what it is that we're, we really need to do overall. And so I think that, yes, forums like this, but also using these as platforms of direct access to continue very important conversations that move us forward is going to be the next step. And you can just, I tag team on that? Just of course you can. Of course you can. Okay. Um, as an artist, talk to your collectors about the fact that they can loan their work because a lot of collectors don't even know that. And so they're buying all of this beautiful work. They got six of your pieces. Let them know like, hey, I want to be in the high museum. Can you take your collection, make sure that, you know, make sure that they're keeping track of, of, um, you know, the certificates of authenticity, that they have all of the information about your work that they need, but encourage them to educate themselves about the fact that they can loan their collections to museums or that they can loan their collections um, to curators to help you as an artist get into other places. You would be surprised at how many people have amazing collections at their houses and don't even know that that's an option and that that's helpful to the artists. So once again, I'm hearing a theme of education. I'm hearing uh, a, a sort of uh, assertion that we're all curators in a certain way because we are collecting, we are making decisions about what we value, what we think is important. I'm hearing a wonderful set of possibilities uh, for diaspora rhythms uh, in uh, the future sessions of Art Smart to dig into some of these, the home collection and what to do with it, how to get it out and establish uh, relationships uh, with other curators so that it gets circulated and may travel. I mean, just, just a, a wonderful wealth of ideas, I think, that you've sparked for all of us here on the call today. Our time is almost up. And so before I turn it back to Sherry, uh, I first of all want to just thank you. I, I think we could have had a 90-minute conversation with each of you individually because it was such a, a rich uh, exchange and so many great ideas that, uh, that came out of it. Um, I'm going to invite each of you to like, what is your parting uh, call to action for everyone on the phone, uh, you know, on the call today? What would you love to see us as a, as a cultural community do in support of advancing sort of curatorial vision for the future? Like, is there one thing? Leslie's eyes went like, oh, no, I mean, you're not asking me to say that in two words. Yes, I am. <laughs> but, but you know, if, if you could say, hey, folks, this is the thing that you need to do. What is that thing so that we can support this work going forward? Hmm, that is hard. But I think if there's the one thing that I can think that I can think of right away is there's so many people out there who don't know the abundance and the beauty that is black art. They just don't know. And they make the false assumption that just because it's not in a major institution, it's either not there or not important, but the work that you do shows to the contrary. So if there's one thing that I would think that the thing that I would ask, if you ever are thinking about, is to preserve the stories with your, that are associated with your art and make sure that the world knows about what you have. Those are the two things. And do not in any way, shape or form, think that being in an institution, make sure what you have more valuable or more important. It just does not, it doesn't. That's Great, thank you. Um, Zdeko or Janice, who wants to go next? I would say just be open to, you know, pathways and possibilities, you know, remove a lot of the veils as much as you can of what you think, how these relationships are supposed to work, in what timeline, in what space, who's at the helm, who's the way maker. If you are moved by a possibility in this conversation, 
even if you don't have it all fleshed out, that's the thing. You shouldn't because it takes more than any one of us to make anything happen. That's what I love about the art world. Make the call. So be open to the pathway and the possibilities, but make the call. Send the email. Send the DM and say, hey, I want to talk about this possibility with you, even if I don't know how to go about it. And that's whether you're an artist, a collector, a curator, an administrator, or an enthusiast. If you have an idea, just start the conversation. No one's going to, you know, badge you for it. But that's where all of the best opportunities in my entire life and those I've seen um, where they started a, a conversation. Sudeika? Um, I would say that every year around um, the first of the year or around my birthday, I sit down and I write two goals. One is what I plan to accomplish in my career for the year and where I see my career in 10 years. And every year I look back on what I said in 10 years. And if there's adjustments that need to be made, I make adjustments. And then what I want to do for the year, I study it. So if that is, I want to um, have a solo. I'm asking artists I know, how did you get a solo? Where's a good place to have a solo? I'm looking for calls for art. Like I'm studying it and I'm preparing myself for it. I'm paying attention to, okay, so this artist is showing their solo and that was work that they were doing for two years ago. So maybe I need to have an older body of work that's sitting and that's the one that I'm shopping out while I'm working on like a current body of work. And just really like talk to other artists and talk to other curators and talk to other people who are doing it and learn from them. Like sit at people's feet and just be quiet sometimes and let them give you what they've got or take you places where, you know, you might come into contact with people. Opportunities like happen at the craziest of times, you know, so stay open to that, but stay studied up. So when that opportunity pre presents itself, you are, you know how to present back. You know, there's somebody in the comments who, uh, in the chat, who is saying that they have opportunities for curators right now. And so That's like, are honey. you ready for that? You know, if you're an artist or a curator or somebody, do you have, have you started that proposal yet? Have you started working on that idea? Don't hesitate, like start it because boom, here's an opportunity. Well, we, we leave this call today with opportunity and certainly with an abundance of inspiration from the three of you. I just want to thank you so much for your time. Before everybody goes, Sherry's going to come back on. I do want to point to um, Cannon Fire Art Gallery saying thank you as an older, non-traditional artist, self-taught. You all have re-inspired me. You've given me courage. And Fran Joy says, I have an opportunity for you. You want to curate? You want to get your chops in? Her information is also in the chat along with the uh, uh, websites for our extraordinarily talented panel, Leslie Guy, Janice Bond, and Zadeka and Zinga Terrell. So with that, I want to say thank you again. And I'm going to turn it back to our host, Sherry, who's going to take us out of this today. And uh, everyone, thank you for the privilege of being able to share this 90 minutes with you. I really appreciated it. Uh, Sherry, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Amina. That was fabulous. Thank you for leading such a great discussion with our panelists. And thank you to the panel of artists and curators for such an enlightening and insightful conversation. Thank you to all in attendance. And we would like to remind you to please mark your calendars for our next Art Smart event titled The Art of Graffiti. And Dan, would you like to say something? Yeah, well, I just want to thank everyone for being showing your genius and educating us and giving us ideas that we never thought of. You ladies are so brilliant. And uh, thank you for Women's Month. This panel, you, you celebrated uh, Ladies Month with such style and grace and brilliance. So thank each each and every one of you. I have to give a shout out to Janice. So good seeing you lady. And, and thank you so much for what you give. Each of you, thank you so much. And uh, the Asper Rhythms, thanks you. Thank you. To join, to join as a member or donate to the organization, you can find out, um, visit our website, and that is also in the chat. Thank you, everyone. Have, Have a great, great afternoon. afternoon.